Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, today's session is a million missions, uh, the contribution of the nonprofit to India's development. Uh, so, as someone whose path has crossed with the nonprofit sector over the last two decades, I've always felt that the nomenclature is not okay. It needs to be called not for loss. Somehow positioning ourselves as a nonprofit is incorrect, and I would like really the not for loss terminology, and maybe some way the word sustainability to come in because we need to survive to fight the good fight. Now, today's session, you know, this morning I was reading a, an article uh, by a head of a think tank which is currently facing the heat. And uh, she mentioned that, uh, you know, India's statistics is in such bad shape that, uh, you know, she was trying to estimate what the current poverty is and all of us are clutching the 2010-11 census to try and make estimates of what it, life is like currently and with the current census being delayed, she said it's a very, very hard task to try and put together statistics. And this is something that today's uh, authors, uh, we have Matthew Chairman and they will, they will talk about it. Uh, they have made the effort in an arena where there is not enough data and statistics to try and make a best guesstimate of what the nonprofit sector is about and what's the size of the sector, its contribution to India's development. And it's a much needed effort in this particular space. Uh, in typical BIC style, there will be no bio readouts. It's there in the event announcement. Suffice to say that we have the heavyweights of the nonprofit sector here today, the kind of day that the Dias Foundation strength will be tested. Uh, we will initially start with two presentations by the authors, uh, Matthew Ch uh, Cherian, chairman of Care India. He will be followed by Deval, a uh, founder of Dasra. So they will give you a summary. I mean, they've done the heavy lifting and they'll give you a crisp summary about what's there in the report. And that will be followed by four sectoral presentations by four people who are from the different nonprofit sectors. And then we round it up with a panel discussion which will follow those solo presentations. So I invite Matthew Cherian to one of the two authors of the report. Thank you. Good morning. I'm glad to be here in Bangalore with uh, what I call as the intellectual Bangalore Samaj which has always been a great, much better than the Delhi Samaj that I come from. <laughs> so that is about it. And uh, actually some of us were discussing that uh, India had completed 75 years. And we said that Indian nonprofits have worked all the 75 years. And Mahatma Gandhi was one of the early starter of nonprofits. And we said, we should estimate what is their contribution to the nation? What have they done in terms of innovation? What have they done in various kinds of things? And then a group of people, which includes quite a few organizations, uh, Catalyst, Dasra, Give India, and various other organizations, Crafts Council of India, we all joined together. There are about 75 organizations. So first of all, I would like to thank all the organizations who have contributed to this report. And this report was released at the Jaipur Literature Festival and it was released in this form. Today, it has been edited and updated. We, we have added three chapters on animal care, age care, and also the crafts portion of it is also in the report. Art, it's called Art and Culture. And so these have been added into the thing. Why it has been added? These people were supposed to finish by January, but it did not get finished. So they were brought in into this. So this one, the green colored report is fresh off the press. So it's being released for the first time in Bangalore. So that's about the report. And I would like to thank the millions of nonprofit workers and volunteers on whose basis this presentation is being made. So one of the big challenges has been that the NPOs are spread across 
all sectors in various parts of the country. And in our country, we do something called the national account statistics. And some of you who are economists will know that the GDP of this country is calculated by looking at this national account statistics. But somehow the national account statistics does not carry the non-profit sector or the not for loss sector or the non-governmental sector. We have to glean it from various kinds of sectors like education, health and uh, art and culture, various kinds of sectors. And one startling fact is 18.2 million workers work for the non-profit sector. And that is why this, uh, this report is called the Million Missions. And out of this, you will be surprised to know that only 9 million are full-time workers. Rest are all part-time and volunteers. That means they get paid nothing. But if you get paid nothing, you do not contribute to the GDP. So that is uh, failing in this uh, calculation. All the volunteers, maybe there are some in this audience as well, your contribution is not calculated in the national account statistics. And, and also people who work for democracy, human rights, and climate change, etc. It is difficult to estimate your contribution. It is considered to be something which is a gray area which you cannot figure out how, what, do the, what is the impact of it. But however, well, those who work in health, microfinance, enterprise, and art and culture, age care, animal care, that can be contributed. Because at some point of time you're doing a service and services are also calculated in the GDP. So this is more the disclaimer for the report. And when we looked at the various sections, we found that education, health, and development and housing are the high contributors to the economy. And also philanthropic intermediaries who are also giving grants or donations or running like uh, one of the trustees of this Bangalore International Center is Rohini Nilakini Philanthropies. So that those all get counted in the philanthropic intermediaries. And lo and behold, we found that all of you put together contribute about 1.94% of the GDP. In terms of number of crores, it is 1835 billion. That is the contribution of the nonprofit sector, which is us. We should celebrate the fact that we are able to do so much to the nation. And we are almost close to the mining sector, which is only 2.4% of the GDP. So what happened is, if you look at a graphical form, these are the people who are contributing highly to the nation, which is philanthropic intermediaries, education and health sector. And microfinance has been, the, Professor Sriram will also talk about it, microfinance has been the leading edge to the voluntary sector working in livelihoods. And the impact is they have been able to impact 13.4 crore people and families in the country. So that has been the impact of the nonprofit sector in microfinance, a huge contribution. And there is a chapter on microfinance and inclusive finance in the whole thing. And if you look at it across the years, the GDP contribution has been going up from 1.47% in 2010-11 and up to it is now 1.94 in 2019-2021, 2019-2020. Then COVID struck and as a result of COVID, the government of India has also not published the national account statistics for both the years, 2020 and 2021. And this year, they have also not conducted the census, which should have been conducted in 2021. So our guesstimate is this would have risen to 2% of the GDP. So the 2% is a guesstimate and not an actual estimate because we do not have the national account statistics for it. Then the other part of the exercise was we carried a survey across the country amongst the various NGOs and sent them 
uh, online questionnaires and got the data about how they are placed. And if you look at uh, uh, Niti Aayog has a site called the Darpan site, where most non-profits have to register themselves. And we looked at the Darpan site and we extracted the NGOs from the Darpan site, which is about 1.2 million NGOs are listed on the Darpan site. Out of which the majority are in the two states, which are shaded dark on the your right hand side. And that is UP and Maharashtra have the highest percentage of NGOs. But our sampling was carried out across various states and GuideStar India did the sampling across the country and we got the data. And the data shows that most of the nonprofits are below one crore of total income. And you can look at uh, otherwise, the bulk of the NGOs are also less than 10 years old. And the majority which have done 20 to 29 years uh, have been about 28%. So all these NGOs were looked at from the data of the questionnaires that were sent out and many NGOs filled it up, some did not, but based on the sampling, we have arrived at this estimate. And another interesting thing is, I mentioned to you earlier that 9 million employees are full-time workers in the nonprofit sector. And the most of them are the sole breadwinners of their family. This is an interesting aspect that if they do not work for the nonprofit, they will be not having their daily bread. So that is the kind of uh, estimate that is happening. And uh, so if you look at last mile connectivity, where do NGOs work? We have found that the bulk of them work in the aspirational districts and all the 135 non-aspirational districts, which are the poorest districts, they have been given a new name called the aspirational districts, but the NGOs are present in that. And in many cases, we have found that if you want to drive a program into the interiors of this country, it is the non-profits which are the best bet. So they have been contributing in terms of last mile connectivity. And my colleague and author, Deval, will talk about the innovations that the non-profit have done. Not only do they reach the last mile, they have also done a host of innovations which have become programs in this country. And SDGs, this is something, if we have to leave no one behind by 2030, I think the NGOs are the best bet that we will be able to address all the people in the, across the country. And uh, so if you look at the SDG, which is relating to education and which is re relating to health, then the middle, 51% of them work on uh, education and 47% work on health. And, but they work on all the SDGs. So uh, the UN chief who released the report in Jaipur, Dr. Shombi Sharp, he said that if we have to get the SDGs going in this country, we need to involve the NGOs, not only in all the aspirational districts, but in all the sectors of the economy, so that by 2030, we leave no one behind. So what has happened to the sector? It, in spite of our contribution of uh, several billion and 2% of the GDP, we are faced every day with some form of regulation or other. So it is not true that NGOs who are working, we, have, we almost face a new regulation every month. This has been a government which has given us more and more regulation. So my plea is if we have to get a ease of doing good in India, then we need to ease the regulations of the sector. And second is, Recently, there was more restrictions on income tax. And earlier, most of the NGOs were given a ATG exemption, which is a Section 12A, which gives the donor 50% tax exemption. In many cases, that has been removed. In many cases, there was 100% tax exemption under Section 35AC, 35.1.2, etc. That has been removed. 
and of course i had the privilege to talk to arun jetli who is no more to tell him to bring back these restrictions back into the into the income tax act but unfortunately he is no more and the current dispensation doesn't want to discuss taxation they think that most ngos are not paying their taxes and this should be a new method of taxation for the country and if we have to promote giving in the country we have to give more breaks for the donors and because i used to run help age india 100% of our funds were from individual donors who used to donate and many of them were happy receiving the tax breaks on their donation so this has to be restored back if we have to have a ease of doing good in the india and we have to get to a promotive and enabling policy for the sector unless we are able to do it you can see that there are 9 million workers who are sole breadwinners your contribution is almost 2% of the gdp this will only go down so my plea to all of you is we need to advocate so that there is a ease of doing good in india and may you all work together so that by 2030 we can erase poverty from this country thank you Thank you, Matthew, uh, and thank you all for coming on a Sunday morning uh, during a holiday weekend. It, it's fantastic to see how many people are here. And as Matthew said, I think this can only happen in Bangalore, definitely not in Delhi or Mumbai, where I'm from. So uh, we really appreciate it. Um, I, I think while Matthew and the first part of our book, and we'll send you links to the to the book as well. So we consciously made an effort to not waste paper. So we'll send you all soft copies of this uh, later. But uh, the first part of the report really talked around uh, the GDP, uh, the percentage of employment that we're covering as a sector. Uh, and then the next parts really talk about the impact that the sector has made. And this also has, as one can imagine, a fairly significant impact on the GDP, far more than just the employment numbers that we presented earlier. And, and that's why I thought it'd be important to speak about a, a, a few of the initiatives that were born out of NGOs that have now made it uh, not only to change sort of certain city and state policies, but also national and global policies as we know it. Um, and, and to begin with, um, I, I'm going to quote Amitabh Kant, who said, India's philanthropy and civil society, noted for its vibrancy, innovation, and advocacy, it is, um, is an important nation-building partner for the government. And, and I think this is critical because when we think about the NGO sector, I think we should take a step back and really what is the NGO sector or the civil society sector? It's everyday individuals seeing an issue in front of them, realizing that the private sector cannot play a role to solve that issue, and the government also has not played a role <laughs> in solving that issue. And it's these individuals who take it upon themselves to support their communities and lift them out of whatever oppression, poverty, or issues that they have. Many of these individuals are proximate leaders themselves. The definition of a proximate leader is an individual who self or herself has gone through an issue, come out of that somehow miraculously, and is now mobilizing others in their communities and across the country to do the same. And I think this is really important to realize is because then when we speak about regulation on the NGO sector, you're actually limiting individuals to become leaders in and around their communities and solve for something that the government and private sector is unable to solve for at this point of time. And because it's community led and community driven, chances are these solutions are far more sustainable than what will be discussed in boardrooms in Bombay, Bangalore, New York, London, Delhi, et cetera. And it's sustainable because these communities are there forever. And these leaders will also be there forever. So I think when we start thinking about this sector, I think we need to realize when we have greater regulation, you're actually affecting democracy. 
And Murray Kulshaw reminded me just a few minutes ago, when you start talking about the NGO sector, you need to also realize the strong role it plays in democracy of any nation whatsoever. And I think these are some of the critical factors that therefore, when there's an attack on FCRA laws or other regulations, there is an attack on democracy. And it's up to all of us in this room, whether it's a full-time job or not, for us to really start speaking out against that because there are more organizations that are supporting communities in need that will only benefit India in the long run. And so a few of the examples that we highlighted in the book, um, some of them actually started out uh, here in Bangalore. And, and so I'm going to cover some of those uh, to begin with. So on the social justice side, many of you may have heard of an organization called Association for Democratic Reforms. It's a nonprofit working on electoral reforms in India, which petitioned voters to get rights on information about backgrounds of electoral candidates in 1999. ADR is very well known in Bangalore. They've done phenomenal work across the country, but they sort of had this view. They started sort of researching every candidate that was running for election, focusing on criminal records, financial assets, and educational qualifications. And then three years later, the, the election commission of, of India decided to make this into a rule directed by the Supreme Court. So this is just one example, and you can't magnify it in terms of quantum of funds as it relates to GDP, but you can see how when an informed electorate understands these three metrics, how that enables them to elect better leaders and clearly better leaders make a better difference for the country as a whole. Another sort of phenomenal sort of initiative that, that was started out um, here in Bangalore years ago uh, which we highlighted in the book, was on the healthcare side. And I know we, we will be speaking a little bit more on mental health overall, but in 1964, India got its first registered NGO and halfway home for mentally ill patients. And this was the Medico Pastoralist Association, which comprised of professionals like doctors and clergymen under the Urban Industrial Mission Program of St. Mark's Cathedral, where they got together to create awareness and to provide training and skills required to remove the fear and misconceptions surrounding mental health problems. This happened in 1964. Nachiket is speaking later on, and he is supporting an organization, an amazing group called Banyan. There are other groups that now have come up in the mental health space across India, but many of these groups could not have actually started their work unless if it were these innovations that happened over 50 to 60 years ago. When, when we start looking at, at, at education, um, you may have heard of this group report called Asar. Pratham launched this report, again, about a decade ago, and it actually evaluates education outcomes in over 24 states across the country, focusing on enrollment, learning outcomes, dropouts, details on primary education and secondary education. They use government data on multiple places to bring it all together, but they compile a report that then enables educators, NGO leaders, government, students, and teachers to understand sort of what are these trends. And so many of these innovations that I'm speaking about actually came from grant funding from many times foreign sources uh, that supported these initiatives, realizing that if there's greater data and greater community participation, then we can really get closer to achieve our goal as a country to, to, to meet the SDGs. And, and, and so in this book, uh, we, we really try to highlight many of these examples. And in Bangalore alone, there are phenomenal organizations like Dream a Dream that focuses on education that's really helped change the landscape of education across few states focusing on the child itself and, and the happiness of that child. So they've created a happiness index, they've done phenomenal work and they've rolled it out at a state level. Another great group that's here from Bangalore is Quest Alliance, again, focusing on technology and how technology can be used in the classroom. You saw their work sort of growing significantly when COVID occurred uh, because they already had sort of a tech backbone enabling students to interact with each other and their teachers not having to go to schools. And so like this, there are multiple organizations that, that, that are really looking at work, not just in India, but, but globally. And, and when we speak about NGOs, I know Matthew was talking about, and even the report we highlighted uh, since independence, but I think it's really important to realize um, in 19, 
1945, I believe, um, 1945, Dr. Ambedkar established the People's Education Society for the Advancement of Scheduled Caste Students, 1945. And what this did at that time was establishing itself in approximately 30 schools and colleges in Maharashtra to offer free ships and scholarships to SC students. These institutions were built around the Ambedkar blueprint that centers moral, social, and political education linked to caste emancipation. Their key features include giving students the opportunity to work and earn while pursuing their education and allowing them to gain admissions in dis disciplines of their choice, irrespective of past performances. And so these are things that happened even before we became a country that still exists today. And really the goal, I think, of this report was for us to, again, celebrate the phenomenal work that all of these communities have done across the country, number one. Number two, to help individuals like yourself, many of them, many of you who may not be in the NGO sector, to realize the importance of civil society and support it whether it's in speaking about the ease of doing good in our country, because as NGOs, if we speak about it, we're not looked at favorably with the current government, but you can speak about it. Whether it's to understand more of what's happening more in your community, or it's helping these organizations scale their activities. Even one of the first malaria projects globally actually started in India in the 1950s and 60s in West Bengal, and it was actually to look at malaria, see what uh, impact it had on villages, and that blueprint then came to, from India, from West Bengal, and was taken across the world. And so there's so many innovations that we have in India that have been taken across the country and the world, which needs support. And if anything, at least we need trust that we're doing the right thing. Uh, and, and so with that, I know we have a few more speakers coming on, and I think there'll be a panel discussion as well. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, you know, uh, the thing that when I went through the report and uh, Matthew sent me the non-green report, which had, I think, three or four sectors covered, which now has seven sectors covered, uh, two things stood out for me. And we'll talk about it later on in the panel. I mean, whether GDP is the best indicator, percentage of GDP, the best indicator. In fact, the report mentions that some of the advanced countries, which actually measure this in great detail, the percentage of GDP goes up to 8%. As far, and, you know, the other thing which Devil was talking about, in fact, I would recommend that you, there are, I think, over 50, 60 incid uh, incidences of Change being brought up, I mean, he mentioned ADR as one particular example and a few others, the Ambedkar example, etc. The report is replete with these anecdotal stories about seismic change uh, brought about by civil society organization. And it's in these anecdotal stories that the sector comes alive. It's as uh, uh, Matthew initially mentioned, I think they will also mention, it's the individuals who make the sector come alive, the individual efforts across the country that make this come alive. So what we will next move on to, we'll have four speakers who will talk about their respective sectors and the four of them, I mean, we will start with uh, Mayura, who is from Craftisan, she is founder of Craftisan, she will talk about the crafts and handloom sector, uh, will be followed by Shiv Kumar, uh, he is a co-founder of uh, the Catalyst uh, group of uh, institutions and as the name suggests, he is part of the group that has catalyzed this whole initiative towards improving the sector by 2030. Then we'll have Bharti Damchandran, who is the CEO of the Federation of Indian Animal Protection Organization. And at the rear of these four speakers, we'll have Sumit, who's the CEO of Give, formerly Give India. Now they've decided just Give will be sufficient. So these four speakers will be up next. And we start with uh, Mayura. So as is the case with BIC, when I look at the audience here, I see so many craft connoisseurs and handroom lovers. So it's a real privilege to represent the sector today. Um, my connection with craft started way back in 2006. Um, and over the last 10 years as an entrepreneur. Uh, but as a consumer, it started at an early age, right from school. And that's thanks to the right exposure. 
So, you know, if you look at the crafts and handloom sector, it's really large and fragmented. All states in India have a, you know, craft and handloom heritage. Um, many states such as um, Bengal, Orissa, you know, each district, in fact, has its own uh, distinct craft or handloom, um, you know, uh, cluster. And um, it's, the number of artisans are huge, but there's no verified data. I actually did a survey uh, in preparation for this panel, and I asked craft and handloom practitioners, how many artisans are working in the sector? So numbers as high as 200 million, but the majority said there is actually no verified data available. And that is a complex situation amongst which the civil society has been working across states, across districts. So I have a few notes, just so that I can stick to the strict timeline <laughs> we were given. Now, if you look at, um, you know, the 75 years since independence, um, civil society has uh, played a strong role, particularly in reviving, uh, languishing crafts and handlooms, organizing artisans who are fragmented in small clusters, getting them together, forming collectives, creating livelihood opportunities, both rural and urban and across genders, conducting a lot of skill upgradation programs, and of course, raising necessary funds to support uh, cluster development. Social entrepreneurs, designers, craft pract practitioners, uh, they have all come together to contribute towards the market side of it of things. So if you look at fostering design and inno innovation to keep crafts relevant, you know, functional, contemporary, um, keep up with uh, market trends, um, funding working capital gaps, looking at, you know, um, absorbing risk of production and inventory, and most importantly, look after sales and marketing, with most artisans, uh, you know, in remote areas and not connected to markets. Now, while the overall number of women in the labor force in India has actually declined over the last 30 years, both urban and rural actually, the number of women in the crafts sector, crafts and handloom sector has significantly increased. Women who are considered ancillary workers and not artisans. For example, in weaving, it's not just the weaver who's the artisan. Um, spinning the yarn, dyeing the threads, setting the loom. These are all activities that an artisan does. And thanks to efforts by organizations such as ICA, women weavers are now acknowledged and given artisan cards. Across the country, many unskilled women, most of whom are also unschooled, have been provided skill training and organized into group enterprises or provided support for micro-entrepreneurship. Vulnerable communities, and I'm talking about communities such as the disabled, physical disability, intellectually challenged, uh, women rehabilitated from trafficking, domestic violence, transgenders, many of whom have absolutely no opportunities for mainstream income earning, have all been provided uh, job and income opportunities thanks to crafts. Because crafts has crafts and handlooms. Crafts has the ability to be customized to suit ability and geography. And I think that is something very distinctive about the sector. Producer companies have been set up to collectivize artisans and to empower them as stakeholders. And it's actually interesting that the only successful examples of producer companies, both in the crafts and handloom sectors, are entirely comprised of women. Industry, Rangsutra, Chitrika, these are all shining examples. Last year, Craftisan had visited a dari weaving cluster in Telangana to evaluate setting up a producer company. And um, after consulting with existing producer companies, we were told very strongly, do not start if you don't have at least 50% women. Because in, you know, rural economies, women have been seen to collectivize and work together far more efficiently. So yeah, we actually didn't uh, decide to go ahead with that project. Now, in the craft sector, there are very low barriers to entry. Right, especially on the market market side. I remember there was a point pre-COVID where every week there was a new e-commerce portal, you know, coming up in crafts. Because really everybody thought, you know, let's try and do something here. And, you know, there's there's like I said, there's very little one needs to do. Um the one can do good storytelling, but um there isn't often enough data or or verified information to see how, you know, who's actually creating impact. Um so therefore, collaborations and partnerships are critical here. And, you know, having the right information being shared with consumers. But, you know, because there are so many groups and there are so many clusters, there are so many different challenges, 
collaborations partnerships i felt weren't uh, you know they were sort of few and far till covid happened during the pandemic a whole host of organizations really banded together and very selflessly ensured that artisans across the country were supported with relief rehabilitation and very importantly moving piles of unsold inventory which otherwise they were keeping for events and exhibitions which didn't happen creative dignity is an excellent example of one such initiative so with all the positives um today the sector is poised at a very critical juncture artisan wages have stayed stagnant for years in fact many are still earning only minimum wages and one of the biggest challenges is the exodus of younger generation artisans to white collar jobs now i alluded to a, a you know survey that i had done amongst craft practitioners um so while there are many many challenges these emerged as the most critical younger artisans leaving the trade like i just mentioned tools and equipment are outdated therefore production efficiency is you know not as strong and making products not as competitive insufficient market demand inconsistent and insufficient lack of finance um working capital business loans these are all hard to come by in the sector especially for craft groups that are maybe not registered you know they're too small or they, you know they've not sort of had the uh, schooling to know how to how to register a venture or how to have gst and you know how to have all the compliance that is needed to actually be a registered entity now some of the possible solutions to address these challenges are artisan entrepreneur programs so support the younger generation especially those that you know are working in in a sort of high craft activity groups export market focus to enable higher re remuneration to artisans and more partnerships amongst different stakeholders so like we have mna in the corporate sector i think we should have more mncs in the sector mncs mergers and collaborations in addition we definitely need more patronage and funding whether it's the government csr or other grants we definitely need to invest in infrastructure because only if we can create large scale production hubs can we actually look to create the kind of successful models that are there in southeast asia for example um improving production efficiency is the only way not just to increase output but to make prices more competitive and to increase artisan incomes and i've alluded to this before we need better financing schemes similar to msmes but tailor made for the sector now um matthew had mentioned the sdgs handicrafts and handlooms support 11 of the 17 sustainable development goals climate action for example you know this is a sector that is carbon negative but we are not able to translate this into making the sector more attractive to invest in you know this is some food for thought now i used to always say proudly that indian crafts and handlooms are something china can never copy from us but today on the main road in chennapatna there are shops that sell wooden toys that are a copy of our traditional toys and made in china we are in fact doing a, a project there we've set up a design and innovation lab with one of our clusters so i keep traveling routinely and on one of my recent trips one of the artisans you know told me very sadly that if this situation continues then the name of our town will be changed to china patna <laughs> that really hurt <laughs> yeah so this brings me to my last point how do we educate consumers about crafts and handlooms when it is such a vital part of our cultural heritage how come it's completely left out of our school curriculums kids are not exposed unless families are aware or they happen to be in elite schools urban consumers who are so ready to spend on fast fashion and branded gear of low quality don't want to invest in handmade just because prices are higher like incredible india for tourism created such a strong brand for tourism in india can we get the government to create a strong brand to really market and sell the impact and story of indian crafts incredible india crafts maybe that's it from me thank you
Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Shiv Kumar. I'm proudly a Bangalorean, uh, born in, not born here, but brought up here like many of you. And I want to begin by, you know, building on something Devil said about malaria, which uh, kind of, uh, you know, quipped my, uh, you know, interest around this area. Do you know where quinine was discovered? Bangalore? Taj West End was at least claims that is where the inspiration at least happened. And the second question for all of you, uh, Gandhiji's NGO name? Seva, quite easy to guess that one. <laughs> it's Jyoti Sang. Uh, it's based on Ahmedabad and I had the privilege of working with them uh, on a project. Uh, I want to start out by uh, telling you that, uh, you know, when we talk about the work in social sector, we talk about global north, global south. And uh, I always say we work in 25 countries, but we are proudly global south. But there is a south of the development sector, which is the Bangalore, right? <laughs> Not that uh, other states uh, don't contribute, they contribute significantly. And I think being a proud global south organization, one of the things we've been watching is the progress that has been made, which is really, really fast in many, many areas, including education. But the challenges are many and growing, right? And the extent and the complexity of the challenges, both are very strong. And I want to focus a little bit about evolution and innovation of the social sector. And I want to talk about financing and institutional models within that. Now let's talk about financing. Uh, I want to begin with the story of a organization which is based here called Swati Mahila Sangha, which is a sex workers organization. Uh, when we began work with them 13 years ago, and it, no, sorry, 18 years ago, there were 13 women uh, who had come together and asked our help to form a CBO, a community-based organization. And their aim was to ensure that they are treated with equal dignity as anybody else, any other professional who is there in the sector. And uh, one of the very important indicators they gave me is, sir, when you walk into a bank, the way the bank manager treats you, a cup of tea and a chair to sit on, I want that same respect, right? And we began their journey with them. And for the last 18 years, uh, they've gone through a whole range of emotions and progress, right? And one of the important progress they made was to work with the government, right? And many of you know MG Road. One of the leaders was actually, her hair was held and dragged by a policeman uh, across the road. And that was a turning point because the women sat together and they said, I said, we could file a complaint with the IGO police. And they said, no, this is going to be a turning point. There should be a, not another woman on whom the police should be able to lift their hand on. And they did that. They did that by taking a very satyagraha approach to it and managed to change the entire police force working closely with them. Today, they have IDs from the policemen, right, in terms of what they do. And over a period of time when HIV AIDS was a big issue, they suddenly got recognized as human beings because we call them as reservoirs of the, uh, you know, of the virus, which is such a sad way to describe a human being, let alone a woman, right? And from there, they turned around and they took funding from the government and managed to deliver a number of service. 20% of the prevalence rate in, in Bangalore of, uh, among the sex workers, right? Now it's two to three percentage. It's largely because of their efforts. But then when they looked at sustenance, and uh, Dr. Mala is here, when they looked at cervical cancer, which was important to them, nobody cared, right? Hepatitis B was a bigger issue than HIV. Nobody cared about it. So they knew that they had to take control of what they had to do. And that's when uh, they came to us and they said that, look, if we earn 500 rupees from a client, we can take home 50 to 100 rupees of that. Sir, we need our own bank. And I went around asking all the banks, including ICICI, can you set up something for these women, which is out of your banking services? The answer was no, because they're not a large number, you know. And uh, therefore, they set up their own cooperative bank, uh, which took quite a bit of an effort to uh, make it work. And I'm telling this long story because this is the story of the not-for-profit sector. And this is the story of women from Bangalore who showed the whole world. So be with me for a minute. Today, they have a 20 crore turnover. They have two crores of profit and that money they use to decide what they want to work on. That intellectual freedom that they needed to focus on what is important to them, whether it's violence, whether it is property rights, whether it is cervical cancer or breast cancer, they are able to prioritize. 
right? And one of their dreams was to say that, you know, you are, we know you're an international consultant. We want to pay you your rate. We don't want your free services, you know? And they do, and they do. They actually give our organization dividends from last year onwards. And it is such a proud moment for them to be where they clap for them. Uh, <clears throat> so what does it tell us about financing is, I think when we talk about financing, uh, for a couple of years, uh, for several decades, we've been talking about grants, very important as Deval was pointing out, extremely important risk-free capital, which we need to use. But then right up, you know, because some of you are from the corporate sector, we also use, e use equity these days in social businesses, right? And there's a whole spectrum of capital. The one capital which is not spoken about is the human capital, which can unlock value and generate ground up capital, right? Which is exactly what Swati Jyoti and Swati Mahila Sangha have shown in Bangalore. And by the way, this has been replicated across several states and there are one lakh 80,000 of them and a national movement called the Taras Coalition has been built with them. So let's also uh, talk about, it's not just about uh, social businesses, huh? social protection, which is, uh, you know, the number of schemes that government announces, state governments and central government, there are 1,600 programs and schemes. Somebody once said, uh, if you're poor, there is a scheme. If you're rich in this country, there's a plan, okay, right? And uh, all these schemes, even having them in a single place, even the government is unable to get it because these are all some of the state scheme, national schemes. So when uh, we worked with UNDP and we wanted to ensure the most poorest get access to it, by the way, only 7% of the poor get access to these government schemes, which are meant for them, right? Forget corruption and other things, we'll talk about it. They don't get it, period. Right? And when we wanted to up the entire uh, you know, uptake of these services, we realized there is awareness gap both with the government and the communities. There is also a facilitation which was required and there was a closing of the loop that the act person actually gets it. Right? And over a period of time, we have managed to unlock some 2,800 crores, yes, not a small amount at all, from the government to these communities. Just during COVID, it was 1,000 plus crores, which, is my, which we've done. Now, that kind of a money is there in the system. It is there, you know, stuck in various parts. And do you know how much money was spent in getting this 2,000 crores, you know, channelized? 10 crores. That's all was spent. And that's the kind of capital which is required to unlock certain other capital. So as we think about what social sector requires, I think let's also get innovative in the way we should be able to unlock value within some of the things that we are doing. Another very interesting program which is going on is around small hospitals. This may be a little bit of news to me, maybe not to all of you. Uh, private sector accounts for 70% of the you know, ambulatory care in India. 88% of the beds are in small hospitals, under 50. And these are husband and wife teams, right, usually, doing tremendous service. And they're called private sector. And everybody thinks of an Apollo or a Medanta when you say private sector. And therefore, they are completely excluded, right? And they don't have a voice in the policy table. And when we started working with them, we realized that they have a huge problem in procurement. They have a huge problem in financing, right? They have a massive HR problem, which most hospitals have, but they have a... Now we are aggregating those services and providing to those hospitals and working with them in improving the quality through a kind of a social business model, which does that. I don't know whether we'll be successful, but we have started the journey. So um, I think, uh, you know, Ravi, you uh, said this NGO or not. I, I use the same word when I started my organization. We are a not-for-profit or loss organization. Uh, then we use the word NGO, the civil society, voluntary sector. I think we have ended up confusing everybody outside uh, but we are very clear. The people who work in the sector, we are all we know what these things mean, right? And I, I think this needs to change. If you want more and more people to come in into the sector and contribute, I hear that all the time. And being in Bangalore, I can tell you, I meet at least six to seven people in the weekends only to see how do they like to contribute in the social sector. That's the kind of energy which is there, not just in Bangalore, everywhere, right? We need to be uh, more communicative on the intent. What are the intent? The bus which drops your children to the school is also an NGO, by the way, because it is registered as a trust or a society, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, is that the same as somebody who works on, uh, you know, what examples they will give in terms of, uh, you know, voter and uh, uh, electoral reforms? Not the same, right? What is the intention? What are the methods they use? What are the nomenclatures which are around? And what is the registration? Is it society, trust, section eight? Uh, what is the focus? I think based on this, we need to bring clarity. I don't know what the answer is. Uh, I know 
maybe we may not come up with one term, but the things which are being bandied around in Catalyst 2030, which is a network of social entrepreneurs, we've been thinking we should call ourselves social innovators or social economy innovators. Uh, the word economy also sets off a lot of alarm bells for some of us, right? And I want to also flag out some of the emerging trends which are coming up in the sector. I spoke about social businesses and somebody referred to think tanks. There are platforms uh, which have which come up, which are focused on education, focused on entrepreneurship. And I'm so glad, uh, Mayra, you spoke about uh, you know creative dignity. Those are the kinds of platforms which are coming up. Innovation hubs like Social Alpha, uh, also single outcome focused entities. There are people who are just working on one thing. Uh, company foundations, uh, whether we like it or not, uh, you know, there are large companies like Jubilee and Piramal have foundations and they are also in the civil society space, right? Uh, wanting to be part of the part of this. And uh, what I want to speak a little bit about is collaboratives. And I think coalitions and collaboratives, uh, again, Mayura, thanks for flagging that out. I think joint action, joint problem solving and making community driven approaches central to what we do is the way forward, right? The, the kind of problems we have are very wide, very deep and very long term. They are complex in one word, right? To do that, no one organization can do it. And therefore, collaborations are important. Uh, and the Catalyst 2030, which is a 191 country social innovator network, does exactly that. And uh, don't confuse it with my organization, which is also called Catalyst. We were set up 30 years ago. Uh, and uh, I, I'm part of the Catalyst uh, 2030. COVID Action Collaborative, which I was involved in starting, works with 386 partners across India, responded extremely well, uh, in, uh, including Bangalore. In fact, we partnered with the, you know, the mayor of, uh, cycling mayor of Bangalore. And one of the things which was a hot property that we delivered during lockdown was hearing aid batteries for the elderly. Right, these were things which were not thought about, right? But was required. How will they keep in touch with the with their loved ones if they can't hear or uh, you know use their smartphone? Uh, I, therefore, coming together is important. I want to end by sharing a story of an organization which is not from the global south. Uh, you know, Health and Harmony, uh, which has a very interesting approach. They uh, they go to indigenous communities where degradation of forests is very huge, and they sit with them in their terms talk to them respectfully, and they call it as radical listening, where they assure them that for centuries you have protected these forests, and we need you to continue doing it. What can we do to support you in doing that? Right? This is a question we should be asking uh, in all community-driven projects. What can? It's not what is your need. What can you do with your indigenous knowledge to protect this forest and the flora and fauna within it? Right? And the answers have been dramatic in terms of impacts. And for the randomisters, there was RCT conducted. They have been able to show, uh, you know, enormous improvement, not in small counts. And for the health people in this room, Nachiket, Mala and others, uh, tremendous impact on health because they decided what they want to prioritize, how they want to do it, and they were resourced to do it, right? And I think these are the kind of approaches which are going to be uh, the next generation of our work. Uh, and uh, believe me, the hard work done by activists on the ground to raise the issues is no smaller or better, no less sexier than a social business. I think all are important. And that's the beauty of the sector is that you need this color of, uh, you know, not even thousand flowers. It's uh, millions of flowers, as uh, Matthew and Devala put it. We need this because we are addressing a complex problem and we need all your support. And if your individual is not working in social sector, reach out to one of those who is mentioned in the book. And if you are working in the sector, let's collaborate more. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Bharti Ramachandran, and I work with an organization called the Federation of Indian Animal Protection Organizations. So how many animal people do we have here? Animal lovers? We don't care what animal. Uh, <laughs> all right. OK, quite a few. Bangalore is actually one of the most uh, animal friendly cities uh, in the country. And uh, but I want to take you back to uh, a 
book that I read. It was it came out in 1975, I think. It was quite a seminal book called Animal Liberation by Peter uh, Singer. And he said that you don't have to work, you don't have to love animals to work for or believe in animal rights. Um, you just have to believe in justice and in the concept of rights. Uh, and uh, so this is the belief that really informs the work of the animal protection sector. FIAPO is a federation, so it's an apex body. We have about 190 uh, member organizations and we have close to 1,700 uh, activists across the country uh, working on various issues who are affiliated with us. Now, um, I am very grateful to be here. I also happen to remember the previous version of this, not the version of this report, the previous report on the nonprofit sector came out sometime in the early 2000s. It might have been 2001 or 2004, I, I forget. And it was called The Nonprofit Sector in India, Invisible Yet Widespread. Murray, you'll remember that book. Um, and uh, this was a book that I read every word of because I was very new in the sector at that time. And um, Thankfully, in the last 23 years or so since that book was published, the nonprofit sector has become much more visible, but the animal protection sector still remains invisible and widespread. Uh, if we look at the numbers of organizations that are working in animal protection, there is a body called the Animal uh, Welfare Board of India, and there are 3,700 uh, organizations that are registered with this body. Um, and 60% uh, of them are Goshalas or Pindra Poles, 6% of them are SPCAs. There's, an S uh, there's a Supreme Court ruling that every district in India should have a Society for Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. Um, of course, we don't have, but 6% um, of these organizations are SPCAs, and then the rest are other organizations that work on various issues. So the actual figure of animal protection organizations is likely to be about 100 times higher than those registered with the uh, Animal Welfare Board of India. Um, in, in a country especially with uh, such uh, widespread poverty and with appalling indicators on other uh, indicators on education, health, gender, it is not surprising that uh, work of animal protection is seen as having secondary importance. Uh, we in the animal protection sector see this as a social justice uh, issue. Um, but I want to take you back a little bit to an innovation that India has done in legislation when it comes to animals. Legally, animals are seen as property. But in 2014, there was a landmark case where the animal uh, called the Animal Welfare Board of India versus A. Nagaraja, where the Supreme Court rejected the prevailing paradigm of animals as mere property and stated that animals possess an inherent dignity that all sentient beings do and that extends beyond their mere use to human beings. So this is kind of one of the most progressive legislations in the world. And animal protection work is so is so vast, it's so diverse. There are people who do, uh, you know, the ones that are most visible are the ones that work with stray dogs and cats. That's the most visible aspect. The most glamorous aspect um, uh, from the outside, at least, is the wildlife work that a lot of people do. And then, of course, the completely... Um, uh, invisible part of it is the work on farmed animals that a lot of organizations do. Now, I'm just going to take one little example for each. Uh, in farmed animals, uh, you know, this pertains to all animals that, um, that are raised for food, uh, for example. And in uh, FIAPO did a, a study, an investigation into 241 aquaculture farms in nine states. And we found that the conditions in which fishes are, uh, are um, farmed, uh, not just affect the lives of the fishes while they are alive, uh, but the, we found pres the presence of heavy metals, arsenic, antibiotics, carcinogens, problems like overstocking, water uh, poor water quality. And it was very, very clear that um, the, what was affecting the welfare of fishes was also affecting the health of human beings and the environment around. It was polluting the soil, it was polluting the water all around. And um, FIAPO's a large part of our work is on the advocacy uh, of for farmed animal welfare and against animal agriculture. 
But this is an area where science is uh, very nascent, uh, at least in India. And though we know very clearly that animal agriculture is a major contributor to climate change, and now COVID-19 has shown us that uh, animal agriculture has a lot to do with the spread of zoonotic diseases, we are still a long, uh, you know, we, the suffering of farmed animals is by and large invisible. And of course, this sector, this area of work has a lot of intersections with livelihoods. So we are also, uh, we need to start working in collaboration with the, the livelihood sector much more. The other area of work, which is stray animals. So in India, uh, stray animals are not seen as homeless animals the way that they are called in the US and the UK. They are seen as community animals because the care of these stray dogs and cats is on the community. And the recently notified uh, animal birth control rules have clearly stated this, that these are not um, homeless animals that need to be shut away or taken into shelters, but these are community animals. But there is, as you must have seen in the papers, there's increased polarization that is there around the care uh, of strays. Uh, rabies, India is a hot spot when it comes to rabies, and the implementation of animal birth control um, rules needs a lot of political will. Last week, I was in Lucknow, and... Um, Yes, I was quite, um, I, I was in Lucknow and uh, the UP government has actually released about, I think it's 50,000 crores, plus has issued a mandate to every municipal corporation and every gram panchayat uh, to conduct animal birth control. So, and they've, I think in Lucknow alone, they've been given a target of completing 80% of sterilization of stray animals by next year. So uh, this, this, work requires a lot of uh, a lot of um, what do you call it no, political will but it also needs citizen involvement in bangalore there is this fantastic person called priya rajagopal chetty many of you might know her are you in the room priya no, Priya is not here. So Priya is this fantastic woman who has created these animal squads across the con uh, across the city. And there are these canine squads that have, they know exactly which dog is moving from which road to which road. So these are concerned citizens who've come uh, forward to really do the work of animal birth control and the care, the medical care of uh, animals. But this tray uh, is going to be an explosive issue that we all need to unite night around in the coming um, days, days actually, months, weeks. Um, the third area is that of wild animals. And I'm going to take just one animal here because we don't have time. Uh, elephants. Uh, elephants are a Schedule 1 animal. They are also uh, a Schedule 1 animal that India allows to be privately owned. And many of these ele uh, elephants are in temples. Let me tell you the story of this one, a two-line story of this one elephant called Techi Kotukavu Ramachandran, shares my name, the second half. But uh, Techi Kotukavu Ramachandran is blind in um, both eyes. He's ailing. He is at least 65 years old, though on record his age has been uh, 50 uh, for the past many years. Uh, because, you know, the Kerala rules state that you have to retire elephants from working at the age of 60. So he's been on paper. He's been 50 forever. Uh, very youthful. He's also, you know, because he is blind and he can't see, he gets agitated and he's killed 13 people, um, including children. He is the only elephant who's been written about in New York Times and Guardian. Um, he has got fan clubs. Um, E that equal probably Mohanlal's fan clubs. Uh, and uh, he is the only animal to have been arrested and let out on bail. Um, yeah. So Techi Kotukavu Ramachandran's, we are fighting for him to be retired. You know, that's all we ask. But it's been an uphill battle because he, right as now as we speak, the Trishur Puram is on and Techi Kotukavu Ramachandran is being paraded in a group of like billions of people. Um, but there's a brilliant innovation that was done two months ago by PETA, an organization that works on animal rights. And PETA brought uh, in a temple in Trishur, a robotic elephant called, uh, called Irinjalapilli uh, Roboraman. And uh, Roboraman shakes his ears. He, you know, shakes his uh, trunk. He can move. And Roboraman costs just five lakhs and he doesn't dread the crowds because he's robotic, obviously. And so uh, there is this huge 
uh, area of advocacy and the possibility of freedom for elephants, temple elephants in particular, but the Wildlife Protection a Amendment Act, which was recently passed, has given a go ahead to the transport and transfer of elephants uh, for religious and other purposes. And this opens, uh, it makes us very, very fearful of the possibility of wild capture of ele elephants for religious use. The biggest challenge, and I'm going to conclude with this, the biggest challenge that we face in the animal protection sector is that we are seen whether the rest of the country sees us as rights movements or not. We are seen as a social justice movement. The FCRA uh, regulations that come down heavily on human rights organizations come down as heavily on us. Uh, FIAPO is, is one of the organizations uh, that has borne the brunt of this. So what we really need is domestic philanthropy in this area, particularly in the area of farmed animals. And most of the donors are foreign donors because there needs to be donor education within the country that supports uh, farmed animal work, the work around, especially, you know, I don't see climate funders looking at the possible, looking at animal agriculture. Uh, I don't see climate funders looking at vegan advocacy and how important that is. Um, uh, you know, education, college and school education on animal agriculture. And this needs to happen because otherwise the plight of farmed animals is extremely widespread, but it is invisible and it is very normalized. So thank you. After all the inspiring speakers uh, before me, I'm going to move the conversation to a very, very mundane, uh, basic thing, right? Not at all remotely as inspiring as everybody else, and that's money. Because for anything to happen at the end of the day, you do need some money uh, to get things moving. My name is Sumit, and I work for uh, Give India. It's now called Give. And our job is to solve that part of the equation for the social sector. On one side, we work with 3,500 plus nonprofits. On the other side, we work right now with around 250 corporates uh, with approximately seven to eight lakh retail donors uh, and uh, a few HNIs. And the purpose is to be able to do everything that it takes to move the capital where it exists, which is all of these entities on one side, to the ones that want to use it on the other. Now, let me give you the good news. The good news is uh, there isn't a shortage of money. There isn't a lack of intent to give. There isn't a fundamental cap on how much money can be available for the social sector. The real shortage is of trust. So uh, more often than enough, it's not that the money isn't available, it's that the decision to give becomes stuck or becomes restricted for various other reasons. As of today, there's $12 billion of money going into the social sector through giving in India. 3 billion out of that, 4 billion out of that, which is CSR, is legally mandated. Directors have serious liabilities on them. Uh, if anyone's a director on a company that needs to be covered under the CSR mandate, rest assured, one of the things they have definitely asked at their board meetings is, are we all good on CSR? Not necessarily what we did on CSR, but are we fine on CSR? Have we met all our requirements or not? legally mandated $4 billion committed by every single corporate in the country is not a small thing. Add to that the fact that Indians have historically been given giving as individuals. It's part of the culture. It's part of what you kind of are taught as you grow up. What hasn't shifted as much is how does that money find its way 
whether it's corporate money or individual money how does that money find its way to interventions to organizations to people to causes that can actually make a real impact on the ground and do it in a very very efficient and effective way that's where the problem is actually stuck right now and i know there are many facets to this but uh, i'm still highlighting the ones um, that we actually get to see play out uh, practically every day why is there a shortage of trust um in my mind it boils down to two things number one there is no data available uh, the one that's available is so limited and so restricted um that if anyone wants to make an intelligent giving decision and not just an emotional giving decision uh it's very hard to do i'll give you an example if you want to invest 10000 rupees in any indian company uh there are at least 20 places on the internet where in the next 10 minutes you will find out everything about that company as a lay person as not somebody who understands finance it's available it may be faulty but it's available try finding out how much any ngo that you have ever heard about how much was their budget for last year and what what did they do with that money 9 out of 10 times you'll spend the next half an hour working hard on the internet or talking to somebody that you know about before you'll get that information and try and comparing that across three other companies next to impossible there is a lack of data then there is a lack of data on what happens with the money afterwards and it's not because the ngos are not doing well enough they're doing very very well but that data rarely gets to the person who has to then use it to make the next giving decision investments are easy to make giving is emotional you're very rational in your head when you're investing you're very you're really emotional when you're giving as an individual and there's a much higher barrier to cross therefore for that money to to get allocated the second uh, the second aspect of why there isn't trust is because increasingly there isn't time to build that trust all of organized retail giving is increasingly moving towards social media for obvious reasons that's where the givers are there are 20 crore online shoppers in india there are less than 10 lakh active givers in india online that's the big gap where is that gap it's largely available on social media the amount of time that any of us spend on anything on instagram which is the largest uh channel right now for social media for giving is less than 3 seconds so whatever you want to put out there has to be conveyed in those 3 seconds and we've seen this on our own campaigns and we run many of those uh if you haven't been able to convey the point in a manner that it connects with the audience within those first 3 seconds the rest of it is a waste right put these two together the situation that you're in is you have somebody who's willing to act isn't very sure about how to do it does not have the time to look any further and therefore ends up making more often than not an emotional decision where what should have been 10000 ends up becoming 4000 what should have been a commitment to do this every month ends up becoming a one time donation uh with a rationalization which says let me see how this goes and i'll come back and do this again and that's a very different journey take the same story to csr most professionals in csr are operating in a corporate environment as as mina will point out right they're operating in a in inside a corporate environment they have targets they have things to do the amount of time and attention available to understand the intricacies of what is to be done with that money combined with a constant fear of saying am i investing in the right organization because my job's on the line if i chose the wrong ngo to partner with uh but if everything goes well then it's all fine so you're operating in an environment which has a ton of downside very limited upside what's the result you stick to tried and tested themes you stick to things you know about you do not want to experiment too much 
you you play it safe not because there isn't money but because there is limited trust there is limited time increasingly and i'll i'll just bring this to a close right because uh, it's not that there aren't solutions either <laughs> uh i think there are extremely good examples of organizations that are finding those solutions working on them we are doing a few there are others that are doing it all of this comes down to saying the entire fundraising journey for a non-profit and i'll extend that to the sector but i'll keep it limited right now to an individual non-profit the fundraising journey of a non-profit has to see the kind of investment and attention that it needs from the donors to come in at the non-profit level as well all too often this is seen as a market problem or this is often seen as a problem which is to be resolved at a sector level uh not necessarily the case increasingly the ones who are resolving it at an organizational level are actually finding a lot of success in it uh the tools are the same that any other organization in the world would use because the donor you're going after is the same as the consumer who's buying everything else with that same amount of money right so it's just a different need so with that i'll bring this to an end thank you now i'll invite our panelists uh, on stage so if the authors could come on nachiket shriram meena please join us on the stage okay let's get started so uh, i th i think i'd like to start with the three who haven't had a chance to speak and just uh, your take i mean you some of you have been i think nachiket you've also been part of the report and you've done something on the mental health section uh your take on this whole exercise because if i understand it the idea really is to showcase as an aggregate what is the non-profit sector about and why the government you're literally in a sense the unstated audience is the government saying hey we are doing a hell of a lot of work out here care i mean take care of us and we are actually useful citizens it's almost a plea of that kind the uh, agenda of this report as an outsider when i read it so what's your take on this whole effort both in terms of trying to size what the effort is and the kind of innovations that they will spoke about and then we heard some of the sectoral people talk about some of the issues on the sector so your own respective takes on it and nachiket we could start with you you're the seasoned pro in the room no i think the report has done a marvelous job in a very data scarce environment of trying to understand what is going on and people like reval and matthew are they've been in the sector yes. for a long time and matthew really over the years has inspired many movements uh in structuring the sector building you know the challenge that were raised about trust and other things the credibility alliance that matthew helped create uh very much the idea was uh to address uh this issue so um you know obviously we don't know what the precise answers are uh but the report has done as good a job uh as one can uh, imagine i think the challenge we are all facing somewhat said and said as you pointed out which is you know we are living in a in a country and many countries are like us but certainly you know we are one of them where a very small minority you know in one of the blog posts i had tried to calculate this number uh and that includes us in this audience uh control somewhere near 70 80% of the assets and the income of this country we are living you know the average gdp average per capita income of india is about 2500 dollars yeah. um we 100 million people uh have a per capita income of 15000 dollars right and that is measured at nominal rates if you measure at purchasing power parity rates because the balance contribute to us you know you just do a calculation in your head of how much does one hour of your time saved by your maid or your driver what is the value to it of you for you yes and how much do you pay right uh, that difference is the net contribution she is making to you and your wealth right. 
and it turns out that our income doing that calculation is about 60,000 US dollars, which is okay. Scandinavian uh, levels. levels. Um, and the balance billion odd people are living sub-Saharan Africa uh, lives. Unfortunately, you know, when we talk about growth, when we talk about economy and the word markets was mentioned many times, it's entirely focused on this 100 million people. Right. Uh, because much of the growth also comes Benefits come uh, to them. In any government that is capability focused, that is focused on growth, that is obsessed with growth, is basically saying we don't really care. And the problem with India is we are large enough. See, most other countries can't say this and get away with it because then they will have only 100 people that they're working with. Right. We have 100 million. It's a large enough economy that we can ignore everybody else. Right. Uh, and run an economy and pretend we are all doing well uh, because, you know, the size is there. And what this sector is doing, and that's, I think, where the tension is coming from, is saying to us, forget the government for a minute, that we can't run a country like this. We can't run a society like this. And, you know, is it animal welfare? Is it the welfare of people? People who don't have a seat at the table because they are not yet able to contribute to that growth momentum that we are talking about. Um, and I think the real challenge, therefore, is Partly government, maybe, you know, and I would say for the moment, perhaps we are giving too central an importance to that issue. Uh, but what exactly can we do for these billion people? And you heard some examples from Shiv, for example, the issue of, you know, what is the resource they themselves have? Uh, you heard from the crafts uh, people. Uh, what are they doing? Um, and what, you know, perhaps the sector is already doing and can do more of is catalyze that capability. Right. Uh, because while I get the point that we have $15 billion in the market for it, the reality of our country is these are all very tiny sums of money and they will allow us to run an organization well. They will allow us to have an impact in some ways, no question. But will it change the lives of a billion people? I'm not entirely convinced it will until we find ways um, that, and you know, earlier this, uh, Matthew mentioned this issue of the microfinance sector and Professor Shiram uh, knows a lot about it. One sector that really tried to get there, uh, unfortunately, its growth has come to a certain point and then has gotten stalled right. um, for a number of reasons, which I'm sure Professor Shiram will talk about. Do we have other movements of that nature that we can imagine? Um, I think to me, that would be very exciting to debate and discuss, um, in addition to the challenge of how can we speak to the government right. uh, to allow us to do more. In fact, you make a valid point, and I'm reminded, you know, when I, I set up this thing called City Connect to connect business with local issues, and I remember talking to industry CEOs, and the point I used to mention to them as to why they need to get involved, I said, take your most productive employee, let's call her Shanti, it is likely to be a woman, unlikely to be a man. Mm -hmm. And what chances of Shanti being productive if her maid Shantala doesn't land up at the doorstep at 7 a.m.? This was the case I used to make. And saying that here's why you need to get in, in, involved and invested in Shantala's life. Because if Shanti is delivering the profits, it is going to happen only because, and the point that you mentioned, there's a whole uncovered amount out there which drives the, I mean. Yeah. Unfortunately, you know, one of the issues, I work in healthcare. And one problem that we are facing, why that growth argument is not carrying through, is that we can't actually make a case that investing in the poor helps the country. Um, because the reality is we have surplus labor. And if you make people healthier, you add an hour of surplus labor, you depress everybody else's income. Uh, you really have to not take an instrumental view of investing in the poor. We have to say it has to be done because the purpose of society, purpose of welfare is that. So it's to be done because it's the right thing to it's do. It's the right not. thing to do, except it turns out, and we have a new piece of research coming out on this. You mentioned the Shantala issue, which is a key issue. It turns out that while everybody else's labor doesn't matter, the in-home unpaid labor that women do, if you take that out, six people's jobs get impacted because now the whole household collapses. Right. Right. Her household, not the place where she is working, but the household where she is. And there is very nice work out of Africa, which we are trying to replicate here for India, which shows that maternal mortality 
every 10% increase in maternal mortality changes annual GDP growth rate by 1%. If that is indeed replicable for India, it explains the entire difference between Bihar and Kerala. Good. But I don't know if the data will back us up here. And just quickly, because since I still have you on the line, is, uh, you know, you started in finance and finance inclusion, but moved towards health as your focus area. What triggered that change that this is where you wanted to focus on at a personal level? I mean, it's not really a change. I started actually my career uh, as an acolyte and continue to be an acolyte of Vijay Marjan. Uh, you Who know, happens and, to be a batchmate. <laughs> and very much somebody that inspired all of us to do what we can. I tried very hard to be, you know, I come from Maharashtra. You saw the Maharashtra black thing there. In, in my state, the Kolapuri Chappal the Khadi Kurta, you know, the Jhola, that was the image the Fab India. that we all wanted. Well, Fab India was a much later creation, uh, you know, was what we wanted to do. And I started my career with that aspiration. I was an utter failure in that. And Vijay took me aside at one point and said, Nachiket, you have somewhat of a clerical mindset. So this was part of Pradhan actually. At yeah, that you have somewhat of a clerical mindset. Why don't you sit behind a desk and be useful there? We need people on that side of the table as well. I must say I was very disappointed at that. It was not what I thought I was going to be. I thought of myself as a frontline activist, uh, you know, changing the world. I got stuck behind a desk. Uh, and really, but that idea never really went away. And my work, to the limited degree that I understand this sector, I've always believed that the poor know what to do with their lives. Mm -hmm. We don't need to go out there and tell them, you be a plumber and you be a carpenter. You know, we, we need to figure out what it is that is holding them back. Right. And to me, finance, education, health, and many other things that people work on are the gaps right. that uh, you know, we need to solve for them so that they can do what they are doing. I think finance, we've made good progress. Professor Shiram will tell you there's a lot to be done still. But I, I believe we have set ourselves in a direction that is positive. I worry that in healthcare, we are not there. Uh, we are not there. In fact, if you just wait, it'll just get worse. I know. Um, and uh, um, I, I thought maybe, you know, it's another area to Too try and think about, uh, see what can be So done. more power to your elbow. And a quick data point there, you know, the last election, actually, I got a 2000 survey done, what people are looking for in the elections. And it's amazing. In Bangalore, I thought the issues will be traffic and garbage. Turned out health was the number one issue, especially among the lower income groups. And that's when you duck deeper, you realize that a day not being able to work impacted that family hell of a lot. So health is really at the epicenter of a very important thing. Again, disappointingly, you know, we did this large survey with Lokniti uh, recently <coughs> to ask, is this an electoral issue? Are people voting on this? Yeah, they are not. But as a uh, You're not getting a sense that this is swinging party uh, power, well, which is why for 70 years, the government has not invested more money in health. And Worryingly, and which is why I'm saying if you stand still, it's going to go backwards. The richer states are investing less. So Maharashtra is at 0.6%. Gujarat is at 0.5%. It's Bihar and UP that are investing 1.4, 1.5% of their GDP in healthcare. So somehow people are not sensing that this is an issue on which they wish to hold the government in any way accountable. They are spending a lot of their own money. Right. It's not yet clear that they will change party power uh, on this because politicians are very sensitive. The minute he hears this signal, he or she will swing. In many countries, this has happened. Not yet here. Meena, uh, your take and reflections on what you've heard so far. And as someone, I mean, you are also referred to as the corporate CSR person, so you could even cover that aspect. <laughs> Great. Uh, thank you for this report, I think it's a starting point of something that we really, as the social sector, need to build on. It's really just a trigger, as I see it. It's a wonderful uh, report on its own. But I think we would fail ourselves if we did not see it as only step one. And something that we consensuously and committedly build on. I mean, for instance, now version one had, I think, three sectors. Already version two has seven sectors, but you know, systematically going about and covering each sector would make a, a, a lot of sense. Uh, I also think that these reports can be used as tools for internal analysis for the sector. 
for us to introspect. Because, uh, I mean, I think you mentioned the trust deficit. Why? What can we do? How do we set our houses right? It's OK. We, this must reach the government to say what we are doing. Equally, it must help us to reflect on ourselves. And I think that can be done by uh, kind of using this as a starting point for discussion in widespread consultations among the social sector uh, people. Uh, so I think it's of immense, immense value. You're putting it out there with the basic data. And then we have to see how we strengthen ourselves for the next you know, X number of years. Uh, because that, that's the other thing that the report talks about kind of the past and today. But the scenario is changing so rapidly. We have to use it to project for the future and say how it's going to help us. I mean, what is the social stock exchange, for instance? Uh, how is it going to impact? Is it going to impact most of us? I mean, you said most of them are below one crore. I think the threshold itself is one crore. So what does it really mean? Uh, development impact bonds. I mean, all these new forms of financing that are coming up, how are they going to kind of really be impact? Social enterprise as such, it's still very gray. You know, which side does it fall on? Uh, and even in the definition of NGO, NPO, I mean, we've been talking about uh, how to kind of term it. But for instance, several cooperatives have huge social impact. We don't always count them in our sector, right? Because they are they can distribute dividends. Uh, or uh, uh, social enterprises, some can be not profit, some can be for profit. Where do they count? So I think there's a kind of uh, change of landscape happening. And you know, if we can debate and discuss that, that would be really a wonderful use of this report apart from telling the government here we are and here you know count us count us in both of them like students are nodding their heads <laughs> i know performance appraisal time. <laughs> <laughs> so it would be great i mean i i think this report should just trigger a lot of uh, discussion and debate uh, and and that for me is the most exciting part of it um, coming to this very dirty word of csr and uh, these dirty corporates who you know who we all still run after. Believe me, I have been in the social sector for uh, 38 years. I was in a pure NGO for the first 19. When I moved to a corporate CSR job, I was pariah. <gasps> you sold out for money. Huh? OK, <laughs> if you say so. But today, everybody, you pass out of MSW or the best uh, social work college aspiration, what? CSR job. You were so, ahead of your times, Meena. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this whole, uh, you know, this dichotomy in our minds, where as Indians, we believe that corporates are bad, profits are bad, but we still want the money. So I think there has to also be mutual trust, because I've been on both sides, uh, as uh, Najiket said. Uh, there has to be mutual trust. Uh, but I would also caution very strongly against, and, and the report brings it out that I think almost close to 50% now dependent on CSR funds. I think that's dangerous because one is, of course, the changeability of corporates. As you said, who's making the decision? Somebody who doesn't know the social sector, the CSR committee and the board, please. They are very good business people, but are they the best to take the call on this? Question mark. So agendas will change, priorities will change, strategies will change. That's one part. But more seriously, the NGO sector is there also to critique the other two sectors, which are the government sector and the corporate sector. Now, if I am being, uh, you know, five crores a year for some work in a community and I see pollution coming out of that plant, who is to protest? Traditionally, who has always protested and protected society? It is the NGOs. But if you're kind of in such a dependent kind of handout situation, I really fear for that role. And, and therefore, that loss to democracy and... Uh, it can also be argued in a for-profit company, the big boards, how independent the directors are given the pay they get being absolutely. a director on the board. <laughs> so governance, yes. So these are democracy and governance kind of things, which makes me a bit fearful from the CSR perspective. Thanks. And what, you know, one more thing. You raised with me when we spoke about it, this volunteer and the classification of volunteers as yeah. a, this thing, you had a certain concern. Yeah, Could you uh, voice uh, that? You know, we, we have said that a lot of the time spent in NGOs is by volunteers. But I would like to caution, and I, I probably have been guilty of this myself, we take local people to work, right, in our NGO. We pay them. 
7,000, 8,000, say they're working only half a day, we call them volunteers for legal purposes. So how much of this is that kind of volunteering? Because that's actually, <laughs> you know, uh, bypassing the labor, bypassing laws. labor laws to get a huge number of helping hands. I mean, your whole NGO sector is probably built on that. These so-called volunteers or paid volunteers who are given honorarium, which is below minimum wages. So uh, I think we have to tease this out a little more when we analyze this. Uh, Sridham, uh, I'd like you to address two issues apart from reflecting on what you've heard, specifically the finance and finance inclusion sector. I, you're also on a board of a lot of nonprofits. So I, it'd be interesting to know what are the kind of discussions that really happen at the board level of these non-profits. Uh, Only one. Where do we get the money from? <laughs> <Simple>. <laughs> so, just give us a sense of... Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, if you look at the non-profits, I think w one of the biggest things is uh, funding. And uh, the recent angst, you know, is about whether we... I mean, the current uh, discussion in all non-profits non is, have you got your FCRA renewal or not? And if not, then what? Mina? Just point the mic, mic the other way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's picking up so, his voice. Uh, so, uh, basically, that's the big, big thing. And and as Meena rightly said, uh, when it comes to funding, you're willing to go anywhere uh, as long as uh, they're willing to uh, fund. So, th there is a point in what uh, Meena says that there might be at some stage a uh, uh, dilemma on whether you want to bite the hand that is feeding you at this point in time. Uh, so that's that's broadly. It. But uh, uh, Ravi, I'd like to break this uh, entire conversation into two parts. Yeah, give us that academic framework also, because yeah. you're also a professor. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I, I think we are looking at this entire social sector as one one lot. I mean, of course, you've had a, a sectoral view. But if you were to look at the funding problem, and if you look at the future of what what is going to and how how the entire area is uh, panning out. I think one part of the economy, which is represented by microfinance in a very peculiar manner, is that where you start off uh, intervention as it's a social intervention, but it, uh, it grows into a commercial solution. You know, microfinance was one such uh, this thing. I mean, I think the problem with microfinance was uh, why it did not grow was this interest rate being usurious was a big uh, political no-no. and. The moment the non-profit sector said, no, 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 this interest rate is justifiable and we are not doing it for profits, but we are doing it for covering costs. And that was cracked. Then microfinance sector went into a commercial mode. You know, then capital started flowing in and so on. There is an entire sector where Shiv also works with uh, is uh, basically uh, getting a um, lot of funding, which is basically necessary for startups and for viability gap during the initial phase, but ultimately it is on its own track. So this is the entire social business, social enterprise sector. And I think that uh, part of the problem is being cracked through social stock exchange, patient equity, alternative investment uh, funds, etc. Et so social enterprise is, is relatively in a better place? It's certainly in a better place. Okay. Yeah. What, is, uh, what is suffering the most is the ones who don't have a revenue model which is rights-based organizations, whether it's animal rights, human rights, uh, uh, whether we are talking of people who are filing PILs, um, and people are talking of intergenerational equity, environment groups, etc., etc. Okay. Those are the ones who are really, really going to suffer and suffering. And those are the ones which also had significant amount of uh, international funding, you know, because these causes cut across borders and therefore your philanthropists come across from across the borders and those are the ones which are suffering most and those are the ones which are unable to uh, respond to the very market oriented output outcome logical framework uh, this thing you know what is it that you are going to deliver at the end of the first year second year and so on i think that's something that we need to flag and i don't know how how we are going to address that but that's one thing that is a big uh, this thing on a lighter note, uh, you know, I'm also a proud Bangalorean like all of you. Uh, and uh, as proud Bangaloreans, we seem to claim credit for everything. But I think ADR, uh, I don't know, Raghu would be able to tell me better, was uh, set up over a, a coffee table in uh, IMA faculty lounge. Yes. Uh, I don't know whether you were part of the first PIL, you were, right? So, uh, Trilochan moved to Bangalore. 
Jagdeep moved to Delhi. Delhiites will claim that it is a Delhi-based organization. <laughs> Bangaloreans with Trilochan will claim that it's a Bangalore-based organization. Uh, anyway, it was IMA. Yes. We are okay with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> At least two of us are. Nine faculty, <laughs> two <laughs> alumni, 11 people who are the part of the PIL. I just thought, uh, you know, we should be uh, sort of uh, humble enough to say some of it is not ours. <laughs> Yeah. So, what you're effectively alluding to, uh, Shriram, is you need to segment this market differently yeah. rather than this one size, one catch all. And which brings me to, a, and I, maybe I'll let you finish your points and then I'll come back to this particular issue. Because when you segment like this, and because when you talk about trust deficit, there's a huge trust deficit between government and the civil society organizations. And uh, one of the points that they come, I mean, they either see it as uh, destabilizers of the government or they see it as some terrorist or maybe converting to Christianity. And consequently, you see all these FCRA related problems. So any thoughts about how this trust deficit can be mitigated? Because it exists out there. It's the elephant in the room. And uh, while there's been a lot of good work during COVID, there's been a lot of bashing up that happens from time to time. So any so thoughts there? It is a little uh, difficult. I think uh, it is not so much of trust deficit uh, as it is about the type of questions that one asks. You know, because uh, I mean, this trust deficit is a little bit of labeling. So we'll put it on okay. the side. Uh, I think part of it is all the rights based organizations directly ask questions of the government. So they speak truth to power, what media is supposed to do and sees doing. So yeah. maybe. So, so basically, even, even when the media was speaking truth to power, these, these were people who were talking about, you know, MGN, REGA, right to information, etc., etc., came from the civil society sector. So, I guess the entire rights-based uh, activism, uh, the judicial activism that you, I mean, the legal activism that you would see, and uh, the entire intergenerational equity question. See, what, what has been, if you go back historically, they've been funded by foundations, but if you look at the traditional foundations which have been funding this or the philanthropies which have been funding this, they also come from a corporate background but completely detached from the corporate right. interest at that point in time. The CSR, uh, unlike CSR, which is continuing to attach to the corporate. You know, if you look at a Ford Foundation, Ford Foundation has got nothing to do with Ford right. when it started funding uh, this right. thing. So, in, in that sense, these foundations were completely detached and were able to take independent decisions and there was no overlap between the corporate interests and the foundation interests. I think that's something that we are losing out. And the Indian foundations are not have not reached that level of maturity yet, uh, where they've sort of detached themselves. Uh, the other thing I'd like to sort of, uh, you know, this is this is interesting, but the question is how sustainable is your report? I mean, there's this, this a sustainability question that is asked of the uh, not-for-profit sector all the time. But the question is, would you be able to do an annual survey and gather data? Is there a way in which we can get this data on a regular portal, uh, whether it is, uh, you know, give uh, with, has a, a little bit of database on what sort of donations are coming and so on. But is it possible for us to get data? Now, in these sub, sub sectors, there are some parts. For example, microfinance has its own database through MFIN and uh, so on. So, are we able to, will we be able to create sectoral databases for this? So that we are then able to talk a uh, little more with uh, greater uh, this thing. That's, that's a question that I have. Because survey is not a sustainable way of doing uh, data collection every year. I mean, the NGOs will also will say, are a fear again. <laughs> Once is fine uh, for six months. That's that's yeah. what. Uh, so, and since we are running, and there are lots of questions in my mind, but I just like to ask one to all of you before we go for the comments and Q and A from the audience. I'd like to just take the point that Sumit mentioned, going back to trust, NGOs, nonprofits building trust so that money could come. You know, Nandan makes this point in the context of credit aggregator that the platform that's being worked on. Historically, businessmen stood to gain by having opaqueness about their finance. In the new economy, they actually gain by being more transparent because potentially they can get more money. By the same logic, I think what Sumit seemed to say is that trust building and that openness is not there among the nonprofits. Is that a real live issue? Because let's let's assume that the main problem is, as you said, the board is saying, where do we get? Therefore, it should be in your interest to be more and more transparent. And why is this not happening? I, I think it's not so much a question of transparency than about filing your accounts in a certain format where it can be aggregated. 
I think there is transparency in the sense that you put up your annual report in your own format. You know, it's your uh, there. There are no common standards of reporting. Uh, societies are governed by the Societies Registration Act. Trusts are governed by the Indian Trust Act. Uh, and uh, there is no uh, like if so like gap is there a case for a social gap there is a case for a social gap not only social gap uh, there is a case for filing the returns in a particular format uh, which can be then aggregated you know we don't have that uh, this thing you know you you i mean as a society you are supposed to physically go and hand over to the society registrar a uh, report if you are registered under the Karnataka Societies Act, both in English and in Kannada. I know, uh, right? And uh, we, we, we file that, so yeah. we know that. <laughs> yeah, uh, and and it, it, I mean, if these numbers could just be digitized and put up there uh, at the click of a button. For example, if I were to get the data of any company, uh, I should I should be. I mean, it's easy for me to go to the MCA website. There's a fifty rupee fee to be paid, and I can download whatever returns that they are filing. And there are aggregators of data. I mean, that's what uh, uh, Sumit was uh, mentioning. You know, if you were to take an informed decision about a company, there are large number of analysts doing that. The problem as to why we don't have analysts is essentially because the data is not uploaded. I think we should talk about transparency in that uh, that that sense. And uh, th that's a little bit of a problem because of different forms of organization. You know, Meena talked about cooperatives, uh, FPOs, which are companies, Section Eight companies, trusts. So, you know, each one have their own regula uh, regulation. The social stock exchange seems to be talking about uh, the, uh, at least the document seems to be talking about some standards, but we are very, very far away from it. Uh, Meena and Nachiket, any last thoughts before we go to the crowd? Yeah, Nachiket. This issue of trust, I mean, Matthew can talk about this a little yeah, bit more, but I think Credibility Alliance has tried to do this for a long time. This was the purpose of setting up Give India. In fact, Give India was a social stock exchange. Uh, because the idea was you don't have to think if it's on Give India, it's appropriately. I think the deeper problem Professor Shriram pointed out, one can call it trust, but one can call it, I think the right word is, we have disagreement with you on what you are pursuing. What people would like to support are what I would call substitutive activities. Feed the children. Government is supposed to do it. I'm going to do it. I will get more money from you to do that activity because that's consistent with... Um, what we all regard as a slightly slight role of the <coughs> philanthropy work. But if you're saying, no, I'm going to stand up and file PILs against people who have been imprisoned in Assam because they couldn't show citizenship documents, that, I don't think it's a matter of trust. It's a matter of, I don't think I want to fund this, right? Uh, I remember an NGO came to us when I was in ICICI. They said they wanted to fund vulture surveillance. I said, well, <laughs> we don't do animal work. Why are you coming to us? They say, well, sir, the teddy bear, <laughs> you know, the wildlife work, everybody wants to do, right? Who's going to fund vultures? <laughs> Nobody likes vultures. And when they try to fund through the IPSMF kind of route also, they get into trouble. I'm just saying, so I think the issue is not, I mean, I, I, I would be happy to be corrected, but my impression is a lot of effort has gone into transparency data. I think this reality, as was pointed out earlier by Professor Shiram, you ask questions that people don't like, but that's not trust. That's simply, I don't like I don't. the questions you're asking. <coughs> and uh, I play it safe by not funding people who ask and questions. And I can call it a trust issue, but at the end of the day, if the challenge is, I don't want challenging questions, I don't see there's any other way around it, but to try and think more deeply about beyond trust, where do we find supporters for such causes? Is it in the retail individual? Is it... I had a friend of mine, he was a corporate governance NGO in South Korea. Uh, he accepted no more than $5 from any donor. Because he said, otherwise I risk becoming a contractor. You know, the minute I start accepting large amounts of money, my ability to challenge Hyundai and Samsung, I called him to India to have a chat with uh, SEBI and others on corporate governance issues. He wouldn't accept airfare from me because as a bank, my bank, my previous employer, was a large lender to Samsung and Hyundai. And he said that would create a conflict of interest. I'm not going to accept that money. And then so we friends had to pull our personal funds together to pay for his airfare because he wouldn't accept corporate money. And currently the government has the list of even those donors, which is another worry. Meena?
Okay. Uh, that is something that really worries me. Everything from impact assessment, all very important. But you know, we are, we are being driven uh, and with CSR by corporate goals, corporatization processes, and an outlook, okay. which is very, very different from where we started. So we now uh, invite, uh, so audience, uh, please come down there. It doesn't necessarily have to be questions. I always believe that there's more wisdom out there than maybe on the dais. So feel free to make a comment. The reason we have the two authors here is they're going to answer anything that comes. The rest, three of us, the four of us are going to keep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I usually I sit here, so yeah, I, I, I get the chance to ask the questions <laughs> first. Uh, thank you very much for a good stimulating uh, discussion and interaction on a Sunday morning. Two, three things. One, uh, as we could conclude from here, India is much more than its GDP, measured GDP. There is a lot of unmeasured things. Now, coming to the, uh, uh, what you call, suspicion between the government and the NGOs, that has been the case, uh, I think, for many, many years. But somehow this government <clears throat> has taken it a step further. So they firmly believe that one nation, one NGO, and that NGO need to be the government. So, uh, so they have taken to uh, some of the tasks the NGO has been doing, microfinance uh, through mudra loans, et cetera, or um, uh, crafts, which I think somebody talked about. They have the railway stations, et cetera, promoting um, crafts or uh, the local products in different uh, regions of India. So they are good. But uh, the issue is, that suspicion is a reality. NGOs has a role to play. How we intend to bridge that gap? Uh, maybe discussion is difficult questions, need to be asked, but I, I don't have an answer. From your side, if you can give some light, that's one. Second, I want to give an anecdote about the health sector being a critical aspect, especially for Bangalore. We have a small club where we do some social activities. Just behind our old airport, there is a slum, uh, and where we went there, and uh, old people, uh, glasses uh, or the specs is the issue. And many people believe that at the age of 60, everybody sees like this. So they're not having, uh, seeing things properly. They believe that that is the case for everybody else. So we had a lady who came and we put some uh, drops in her eyes and give her respects and asking her uh, daughter, oh, you look like this now. <laughs> because she has a memory of him, of her 20 years back. So that's a reality right behind our old airport. So this is the, these are the issues. So wherever we can work together, we would like to work together. Thank you very much. Uh, any comments like, uh, anybody wanting to come, please just come down there and make your observations. Yeah. Yeah, please come down. You know, uh, Bharti, I think, made a point about incredible India and incredible nonprofits or something. I think what we really require is a credible India, which is credible in, a, in the fullest sense of the term. We don't need to be incredible. Yeah. Hello, everyone. So my question is that I currently work in a, a research, uh, research regarding data. So uh, fund, in terms of funding, a lot of funding goes into the direct impact, like ed uh, education of children, healthcare, and all of that. But there is a lot of efforts that NGOs make to build up knowledge to gauge into what the uh, government is doing and how much transparency government is offering. So my uh, my work and uh, I work at PACTA, so there we look into what data is actually available on various aspects of persons with disabilities. And we try to come up, uh, we go through policy documents and uh, look up for data, but we could not find. So we thought that maybe a research study could be a good thing to bring it up. But then there are funding issues related to that because it's not something that is directly showing a tangible impact. So I would like to know your insights in yeah. this and regard. Sumit, next to you, will tell you how to get money. <laughs> <laughs> next. And then we could respond to that. I'm Sucharita Ishwar, and I represent Catalyst for Women Entrepreneurship, uh, a platform for 4,500 women who want to start up, have started up, and also are scaling up their not-for-profit as well as for-profit enterprises. So thank you, Ravi, for organizing this uh, wonderful thank, discussion. Thank these two gentlemen uh, for picking BIC. <laughs> well, uh, I thought it was a really, really very relevant and stimulating conversation, having been in this sector for decades. Um, uh, 
I have been working with women, as I said, for decades. And uh, what um, uh, motivated me to start uh, CWE, as we call it, is this is 50% of the population, but they're lagging behind on all the SDGs. And where does the country go? I mean, these are all obvious uh, facts, but um, that's what made me start working on financial autonomy for women, which is what got me started on um, enabling women to become entrepreneurs, whether social, for-profit, whatever they wanted to. And what uh, we recognize, and there are studies proving it, is that as women become financially autonomous, automatically their families, their communities, SDGs go up. So, uh, you know, that's, it's a no brainer. But when uh, I go and talk to uh, people for support, for funding, of course, always an issue for nonprofits, um, I'm pointed towards things like, oh, we work with only rural women uh, to teach them crafts or we teach them, um, you know, um, education, basic education. But in terms of looking at this section, which is half the population, and looking at uh, bringing them on board at whatever level that they choose to, some of them are highly educated, but they are sitting at home, not always because they want to, but they don't know how they can use their skills or the experience that they have until they stepped out and were told that, yeah, your main job is looking after family. So this is a challenge that I face as I work with women entrepreneurs and I talk to policymakers, I talk to CSR folks, I talk to um, other organizations who are working in this sector. So just wanted to share that and uh, maybe take away some learnings from the others. Thank you. Thanks, Sucharita. If it helps you any, there was a giving pledge day long seminar, you know, this is the Bill Gates, this thing. And I was given three minutes at that place to make a pitch for arts and culture funding. That's how much time we got. <laughs> To the no, no, no. I was just uh, sympathizing with her. That's all. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I'm DD. I uh, work at Ashoka Foundation, select Ashoka Fellows. Um, uh, amazing discussion. And uh, of course, I have a question and then a recommendation. The question is, how do, say, think tanks or, say, university research centers, which focus on human rights work, raise their funding? Because it is, a lot of it is foreign funding and Indian donors as well, uh, which, say, community-based organizations or uh, human rights, trans rights collectives and things like that cannot raise, right? Uh, the second, which is more of a recommendation is, uh, um, say in the US or like I was working with the Telangana state government, uh, they introduced something called a social innovation policy, uh, which is focused on supporting the social enterprise sector and sort of helping that grow within the existing ecosystem that they had of uh, the T hub and, and all of the innovation ecosystem in Hyderabad. Uh, and they again was struggling to find a sort of framework to see you know, what is the entire ambit of the sector and where exactly can the government contribute within the sort of government mandate that they had from their chief minister and their uh, sort of political mandate. Uh, so if I am Bangalore or if organizations want to work on something like that, creating a framework uh, that starts anywhere from, you know, collectives and community-based organizations to your, uh, um, the Goonj and Teach for India and Pratham and the giants in the industry. Uh, I think that creating a framework like that would definitely help in policy making. So that's my personal experience uh, and happy to collaborate on that as well. Thank you. Would you like to respond to that question? Matthew, and maybe some of the earlier questions. Uh, okay. uh, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Uh, I want to deal with this uh, suspicion or trust issue. Actually, I like to describe the sector in them. Of course, I did not put it in the graphic form. But there are 3 million non-profits. Call them NGO, NPO, call them civil society, everything, of course. I call myself NGI, which means non-governmental individual. <laughs> okay, so that is, and all of you are 
NGIs, of course, if you permit me to use that translation. So there are about 3 million registered organizations, some as trusts, some as societies, some as Section 8 companies. The Section 8 companies is the most orderly of it. So what happens is you register with the MCA and you, the registrar of companies, and your accounts are in accrual form. This is quite important to understand. And of course, some of you may understand the accounting part of it. Second thing is societies. There are about 1.8 million societies. And there, traditionally, the Tamil Nadu ones will go to Chennai, the Bangalore ones will, <coughs> Karnataka ones will go to Bangalore. And the traditional form of receipt is, it's collected, a stamp is put, and the accounts is thrown on the floor. And there it stays. There's no compilation, nothing happens. But people religiously go and put it. So this is the state of 1.8 million. So codification of that is very difficult. Then there is trust. Trust is even more disorganized. <laughs> so of course, see this is how the situation is. Now, when we wanted to do this study, we tried to see how can we access databases. And the only closest database we get is the Darpan database, which is the Niti Aayog. And there is about 1.2 million are there. Some of the data is very bad. But still, we try to look at it. So we did what is the best possible fit is to look at the national accounts and get the, get the statistics from that. Because there, there is some recording which happens of all this. So there is a need to codify the whole thing, put it on the database, etc. But it is, I wouldn't say it is a task by this group because I went to the income tax. Income tax maintains a dossier of all the NGOs which are registered under Section 12A. And of course, I met the CBDT chairman who told me this data is confidential. And if you want, I can give you the link on the database. You will get the names of the NGOs, but you won't get their accounts. So for me, the names, I know the names myself. So there's <laughs> nothing you're giving me. So this is, and it was approached at the highest level and they don't want to give it. Now coming to the suspicious part of it. And since you don't have data, most nonprofits have filed an accounts. And of course, as Nachiket was mentioning, some years back, around 2003, we started work on this trust factor and set up an organization called Credibility Alliance. And Give was also one of the founders of it. And this said that whoever is a member of Credibility Alliance will put their accounts on the website so that you can see the website and you can determine for yourself. <coughs> but that was the best. But the sector is so big, it is not that it got through the whole sector. The second thing is the kind of donations which are available, only 20,000 NGOs get foreign funds. The bulk of the 3 million get it from local funds, which are philanthropic funds and also CSR and a fair amount of even corporate philanthropy, which used to be there before the CSR Act came in. Now, and there are individuals also giving small amounts. Now, none of this, the individuals are the best thing. I've been involved in fundraising. Individuals give you a donation and you send them back a case study or an annual report, they're happy with it. Corporates are the worst, of course, excuse me. <laughs> excuse me, because they're suspicious. Even if you send them the accounts, if you deal with 20 companies in CSR, each one has got its own format. So I think there are guys sitting there trying developing format. So you get, so if you, if you get money from 20 companies, you report in 20 different ways. You need to have a full department and a small NGO cannot tackle this. And that is one of the greatest difficulties. So, and they're also intensely suspicious. Where did my money go? So if at the end of the financial year, if there's a carry forward, Many companies would say, return back the money to me. And now anyway, under CSR, you have to return and the now money. Now under CSR, you've got to return the CSR. So 
individuals of course are basing themselves on inadequate data and suspicion of course i don't know whether there are any persons from the media here the media will write oh so and so ngo ran away with so much money or such some ngo was driving a, they saw matthew sitting on a toyota land cruiser and going around you know like so the suspicion will come oh this i am giving donations to his organization so this is what the money is being utilized for this is how the suspicion is built so what we tried in this report is to use the classification which is available which is a 12 sector classification education health philanthropic intermediaries and try to determine the what is the availability in those kind of foundations i am sure we would try to put this in a in a intractable form as a database which you people can also access and create your own tables etc and uh, this is something which we have done it is a first step and i hope we can include all the sectors and uh, of course there was a late uh, we were trying to write a chapter on L lgbtq and things like that so more is in the offing but this is a first step so i wouldn't say we have cracked the problem but i think we have estimated what will be the contribution of our sector and we think it is really huge qualitatively you heard from shave you heard from mayura you heard from the others qualitatively a lot of work is being but it cannot be captured somebody said they set up adr and adr of course i know the founders all the data they got was from government records and they when they published the records all the political parties went to the supreme court and said you should not allow adr to put it on a website but the court ruled in adr so we were telling this data was originally your data <laughs> we have only put it on they have only compiled it and put it in a website so that is the kind of thing that we have also done we have taken the government data and now put it in a presentable form so that is hopefully trust and suspicion will sort out in a yeah. it will take a longer period so that's uh thank you i i i, mean, and I think we'll bring this session to a close and i think what matthew said it's a step in the right direction and this is going to take time it's a journey it's a long journey it's not going to be overnight get fixed it's important that we document that we collect this kind of data because uh, and you know narayan murthy keeps saying in data i trust i mean basically the rest of you i, I forget the what the rest part that he says so it's important and thank you uh, for putting this effort together and more power to your collective elbow to everybody in this room and uh, I am sure that uh, jointly we shall overcome there's a huge value in coalitions cooperation and in cross pollination I think the government the private the non-profit all of us need to uh, come together to fix a problem which is really intractable in more ways than one and only jointly we can fix this particular problem thank you so much for being here this afternoon